Okay, so the first thing, you know, I work in fluid mechanics, so I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about fluid structure interactions, which I really think is, is uh, I find a really beautiful uh, kind of set of problems to look at. And, if, and of course, it's, it's central to, to lots of disciplines like physics, condensed matter physics, to material science, to uh, mathematics, engineering, all these, all these, and biology. And so that means that, you know, I, kind of, I came up in, in fluid mechanics. So the first thing I have to do when talking to a, a, an audience that might not be completely well versed in, in all the intricacies of the flow equations is introduce the Reynolds number. So I'm sure many of you have seen this many times, but uh, let me do it anyway because I must, and, and it's always kind of interesting anyway. And so in, in an incompressible fluid, the, the, uh, it turns out that if I, here's, here's my basic fluid structure interaction right there. So uh, there's my generic body, it's got some length scale L and some velocity U, and it's moving through a fluid whose material properties are characterized by two things, it's density and it's viscosity, or it's shear viscosity, here. the red guys right there. And so it, it turns out that once you non-dimensionalize them on this length and, and that velocity, which then also gives a characteristic time scale, it turns out that there's one single control parameter that appears in the equation. And that's just the Reynolds number, which one can repose or think of, though I haven't written it, written it this way over here, it's just the ratio of the inertial forces that the fluid is exerting on this moving body to the viscous forces or the drag forces that the fluid is also exerting on the body. And so then it just has this dimensionless form, rho u l over mu. And that organizes a lot of thinking that one has about the kinds of, of possible behaviors one can have for bodies moving through, moving through fluids. And so this is a, a really nice uh, little diagram from um, Edwin Purcell, from a very famous article that he wrote called Life of a Reynolds Number. And just showing uh, kind of ranges of Reynolds numbers as you move from something that under your magnifying glass is something like a bacterium. This actually should be around 10 minus 5, but he calculated it. Calculated it's four. So a very low Reynolds number. And then if you have small fishes, they have to be pretty damn small fishes, I have to tell you, to get a Reynolds number of around 100. But anyway, it's about 10 to the 2. And then a human swimming around 10 to the 4. And so now that range of Reynolds numbers is also associated with very different ways in which the fluid is flowing around the body and is moving through. And so here's uh, another nice diagram, though, to whom to accredit it, I, I don't know. But what it shows is what happens in the simple case of having flow just around a sphere that's set against an impinging flow, so set in place. And then a very low Reynolds number, so that means then the viscous forces are predominant, there's not much inertia, things like small animals like the bacterium is moving at low Reynolds number. You have this very nice symmetric laminar flow going around it. As you move up, say, to around 100 or 200, you start getting vortices that start to be discriminated from the background flow and are close to the body. And then a higher Reynolds number flow instability sets in, the very famous von Karman vortex street transition, which happens somewhere around 300 perhaps, 250 in Reynolds number. And then a very high Reynolds number, you can have uh, boundary layer breakdown, turbulence, uh, lots of uh, small scale structures, and so forth. But the main point is that between these two regimes, I have one which I have very nice and smooth flow when I think of having small objects and very slow flows going around something versus highly turbulent, highly intermittent time dependent flows on the other, the other range. An important part about these latter cases is that typically changes in velocity as flow is going over surface are very rapid, so you have very narrow boundary layers. And that's an important determinant on the types of behaviors you can see in that system. So then just to to set some numbers to this too. This is this is actually from Steve Vogel. He has this beautiful book called Life and Life and Moving Fluids. And what it shows is just the range of Reynolds numbers that life on Earth experiences. And so a, a blue well, uh, the largest uh, creature living on our planet, swimming along at 10 meters per second, has an enormous Reynolds number around 300 million. And tuna. I, I had a hard time believing that tuna are only a factor of 10 lower because I thought they were much smaller than blue whales, but you can actually have very sizable tuna, two to four meters long. At any rate, moving at the same speed, they're around 30 million and so forth. And then at the low end, you have a bacterium at 10 to minus 5, a sea urchin, sperm, 10 to minus 2, and so on. So this is kind of powers of 10 with a factor of 3. 
And then you have this kind of interesting range, which I'll say just a little bit about for problems that are in kind of this intermediate Reynolds number range, where you're kind of sitting between the world of the small and the world of the big. And that turns out to have some special properties that may be relevant to some biological problems. OK, so, but fluid structure interactions is, is, a, is a very old subject. And uh, I, I, love, I love this story. And uh, these two right here are drawings by my, my very close collaborator, uh, Jun Zong, uh, who's an experimental physicist and also a very good illustrator. But what it does is it, it, first I'm going to talk about the flapping of flags, because that's a very classical problem about which a lot is, is a very classical subject, but really a really sophisticated understanding of why flags flap and what are the mechanics behind it and all that kind of thing has only really been reached in, in the past 10 or 15 years. And so flags, there's my flapping flag, are, are, are kind of a, one extreme of maybe a continuum where I've drawn three from my sample bucket here of, of objects like, say, just a fixed rigid object in a flow that has a von Karman street, a flag which is nice and flexible but passive, and then something that sits like a fish that is both active, passive, and flexible, might have all of these kinds of things. Certainly the fish is the most difficult of all of these to comprehend. But there's this uh, very famous story known to many uh, Asian school children, and it concerns an itinerant Buddhist philosopher. He was very famous, remains very famous, named Hui Nang. And he was wandering the countryside and came across a debate between two young monks who were arguing about the nature of a, of a flag in the wind. And uh, one monk was proclaiming, obviously the, the conversation might have been a little more sophisticated than has come down to us, but uh, one is proclaiming, look, uh, the, the wind is moving the flag. And the other says, no, no, it's, it's the flag that moves. It's kind of back and forth. Is it the wind? Is it the flag? Well, obviously something must be driving the flag. I don't know if that really came into the conversation. But at any rate, there's the master sitting there listening to this, and he interrupts them at some point. He's grown impatient, and he says, uh, I'm sorry, but you're, you're both wrong. It's neither the wind that's moving nor the flag that's moving. It's your mind that moves. And so that kind of stopped the scientific conversation for about a, about a thousand years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there was another answer. I mean, he, obviously he was right in the first part. It's, it's not either the flag that's moving. They move together. It's an integrated system. And actually, that's the beautiful part about fluid structure interaction, so that you have to consider it in an integrated way. The motion of the body being driven by the fluid changes the fluid flow. So it's, it's very intricately coupled, and uh, that makes it very, very fun to study, actually, as a class of problems. So this, the debate, I, as I said, resumes in 1878, when Lord Rayleigh uh, published a, a paper on the instabilities of what, we're, what are called vortex sheets, Vortex sheets are, are mathematical objects that one finds as solutions to the Euler equations of infinite Reynolds number flow. So we go to the limit of, of having infinite Reynolds number. And I just imagine that within that flow, I have a slip surface. So there's no viscosity that keeps pieces of fluid from just slipping along past each other. And he studied the stability of such objects. And, and he identified a, a weak instability of flat slip layers. And he remarked, and it, had, it turns out it had a linear in time growth. So if I had a flat surface where I had a little bit of slip and I put a perturbation onto it, then the, the, the amplitude of that perturbation would grow like here <coughs> in time. And so he remarked, very gritty, very British remark, it's bearing upon the flapping of flags and sails will be evident. And will didn't mean that he was going to explain it to you later in the, in the article. It meant that it should be evident already. So, uh, but, while that is uh, a very classical and, and nice uh, analysis, maybe doesn't have a lot to do actually with flags themselves, which have rigidity, they have inertia, they have elasticity, there may be tensile forces acting on the flag, viscous forces, all sorts of things. And in fact, Rayleigh's analysis is really more appropriate to the wake of the flag, or the vertical structures that, that's leading behind it, rather than to the flag itself. So this is kind of a a version of a flag that lacks mass, rigidity, or anything is kind of a non-mechanical, purely fluid mechanical flag. And so uh, this was a, a problem that was 
I guess, kind of re-energized in, in the early, early part of this millennium. Um, and really in a set of experiments led by, by Jun Zong. We have a, uh, a laboratory at the, at the Karate Institute called the Applied Math Lab, and, and Jun and Steve Childress and, and I run it, though really the, the person who is the, the true bona fide experimentalist is Jun, and he came up with the following experiment. I think just because he was, he likes to think of just beautiful things to look at. And so here's his experiment. He decided he wanted to look at flags. And the way he was going to look at it was in a tabletop experiment where he simply had a gravity fed soap film that was running down between two pieces of fishing wire. And he immersed within that soap film just a piece of silk thread there about four centimeters long. And the beauty of a soap film is that because of the uh, phase differences that you can get by reflecting light, monochromatic light off of the soap film. You have a front and a back surface and you get phase interference patterns. You can see all the vortical structures that end up in this kind of quasi two dimensional fluid. And so uh, it turns out that soap films behave uh, very close in their kind of transverse motions to two dimensional viscous fluids. And so this is kind of an experimental simulation of a two dimensional flag, or rather a one dimensional flag flapping in a of a two-dimensional world in the plane. And one learned lots of interesting things about this, very nonlinear things. For example, if you took this flag and you stretched it and you started off having a very small length, it would stay straight. You can imagine that it's dominated by tensile and elastic forces acting on it. And once it became long enough, so it kind of presented enough mass, so to speak, of the fluid around it, it would enter a, uh, it would jump and become unstable to a flapping mode, and, and it was hysteretic, and so you had this kind of region of, of bi-stability. And I'd say this experiment started uh, a, a kind of an industry, both at both at Courant and uh, in many other places, in kind of revisiting, if you like, or trying to really understand this kind of very classical fluid structure interaction problem. Very classical, but very complicated. And so uh, I think. One of, the, one of the things that we learned, and uh, I think both Charlie and I learned, learned this lesson early as well, is that uh, the, what the main thing that is driving flow instabilities in these types of systems is the fact that the flag has mass. If the flag doesn't have mass, it's extremely hard to have a self-sustained flapping. You need to have kind of this inertial mass that can interact with the fluid and kind of bang it around. And we under, we've understood that both at the level of simulations, and so here is a, a, a massive flag simulation from Charlie using the immersed boundary method. They invented a, a new numerical method for looking at this. And then also in work that I did with a graduate student of mine, uh, Silas Alden, where we kind of reinstantiated in a fully nonlinear fashion kind of Rayleigh's version of a flag as slip surfaces in the flow, but where we also accounted for things like flag mass and, and flexibility and all these types of things. And so uh, the other thing that we did, actually, there's a, I, I just put this up there because it's a pretty picture. Uh, you, we came to understand that there were big differences in, in trying to make a flag flap in air versus flap in water because water is so much more massive. You need the flag to have much more mass per unit length than it would if it were actually flapping in air. And so actually, we, June cooked up this uh, very nice two-dimensional flag. Rather, it's only bending in two dimensions because it's a bunch of brass plates that are on a mylar backing. And then uh, you needed to have brass or kind of a metal flag in order to get something kind of of that scale to flatten the water. So these are just kind of examples from, from our own institute, but uh, there's lots of work going on and still going on uh, in various other, other places looking at these classes of problems. This also led to engineering groups, for example, trying to use these kinds of instabilities as the basis for doing energy harvesting where you just have piezoelectric flags or, or flags with piezoelectric material, say, that are sitting uh, in a stream, and if they're naturally unstable, then they'll flap, and then the bending can produce a, albeit small, but will produce a current. OK. So uh, since we had the soap film tunnel, I, I convinced June uh, that what we should do is we should take the flag and we should turn it on its side. And the reason for doing this is that a friend of mine uh, Alex Gorielli, who was then at Arizona, uh, pointed out, had, had pointed out to me the following really beautiful problem. And, and this, uh, again, comes from this fellow, Steve Vogel, uh, who's an uh, integrated biologist at Duke. And so what, what he had noticed, and I, and I think others as well, is that certain broadleaf trees have, a, have an adaptation that 
if you if they're put into a high high wind, well, first of all, you know they're, the fact that they have a flexible uh, leaf or a stalk rather will let them align with the wind. And these are leaves in a wind tunnel. But if but what will happen is it will start to fold itself in a very coherent <coughs> way, and indeed fold itself up into a nice cone that grows tighter as as the wind speed increases. And this is beautiful. This is a beautiful thing to do. And he had done some kind of back of the envelope calculations showing that the reduction in drag that one might guess comes from this type of behavior could lead to a substantial decrease in the amount of kind of mechanical loading that a, that a tree would have to undergo when it was in a high windstorm. And so, uh, but then it was, his stuff was very, very back of the envelope actually. And so we decided to look at this in a, in a, in a more system, hopefully more systematic way, in a simpler system than a true tree leaf. He was taking boughs of, you know, whole boughs of trees and sticking them into a wind tunnel and trying to figure out what the drag was. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds uh, kind of humanly impossible. So you, instead we went to the very simple. And so uh, what June did is he took pieces of fiber optic glass that he could uh, etch in a sulfuric acid solution and so change their thickness. And since you have, I think, a cubic dependence on, on the modulus of elasticity, on, on the radius of the fiber, you could get a huge, really huge range in, in how flexible objects would be, and you could also uh, change the speed of the flow. And it turned out he had a very nice setup where he could measure the drag by putting a little laser pointer, if you like, on a elastic bar when the, when the flag on its, on its, or rather on this little piece of fiber optic glass right there got pulled down by fluid drag, he could measure the displacement. Actually by bouncing it, amplifying the signal a couple of times by bouncing on some mirrors and then onto a wall. I remember there were these kind of pencil marks on our, on our back wall that you could calibrate and then actually say what the drag was. And so we, we, we studied this problem using experiment and computation and asymptotic analysis. I, I came up uh, working with Silas Sullivan, a student of mine, a, uh, a very uh, simple and uh, informative model that really was just using what's called free streamline theory, a very classical technique for looking at, at uh, flows around objects in the Euler equations that have wakes behind them. And we were able to predict from that, actually, that the, if I had a flexible body, well, let me just say what a rigid body does. If this is like a problem where I have a race car, that as I increase the speed, the race car changes its shape so that will not, the drag will not grow as rapidly. This is something like that. And so a rigid body, just from the scaling of the Euler equations, you know that for a rigid body, the, the drag should go like the square of the velocity if its geometry is held fixed. So it has to grow like the square, and indeed that's what you observe in an experiment. On the other hand, in these types of, of flexible systems, you end up getting a kind of scaling region at the very front that gives you a new length scale. And it turns out that from, dim from dimensional analysis or from asymptotic analysis, you can conclude that that length scale scales like u to the minus two-thirds. And the three comes from the way the elasticity comes into the mechanics. And then that u to the minus two-thirds multiplies that u squared and then gives you u to the four-thirds. So you get a markedly decreased growth in drag by being able to close your profile as the wind speed increases. And we saw this in experiment and then a French group just two or three years ago found the same scaling in this set of experiments where they really did something much more like the leaf problem in 3D where they had conical pieces of mylar that kind of folded up onto themselves. Okay, so I guess I would call that the Mike's classical work. So, but let me talk about a, a, a different set of experiments that, that we've started doing in, in the lab and, and they're really started uh, through uh, the efforts of Leif Ristroff, who was a postdoc in our lab, and then we, we promoted to become a professor. I think we're maybe one of the few math departments that have an experimental physicist as a professor of mathematics on the faculty. But, uh, and this has to do with erosion. And so, uh, I, I've, always, I've been very interested in trying to understand plasticity. Plasticity is a very, very complicated subject. and. Uh, I want to have kind of a solid example I can somehow get my, my hands around and try to understand what's going on with plasticity. And so uh, I said, well, Life, why don't, we, why don't we take a plastic solid and put it into a flow and see how it gets perturbed? And then maybe we can see something interesting and model it and, and I'll understand plasticity. And so uh, what Life did, I'll tell you what he did in a second, but <laughs> you know, kind of 
put the cart before the horse a little bit. I'll say what he did. But it turned out that what he did was to take a clay ball, just a clay ball, and that will yield a plastic deformation, and you can put it into a flow. But it turns out that the flow forces are too small to kind of get plastic yield out of, out of a piece of modeling clay. And so what it did instead is it turned out it eroded. It eroded very, in very interesting ways. And so then, then we've, we've started to think about problems in erosion. And so uh, here, here's just a beautiful photograph that June supplied to me uh, from uh, eroded features that are called yadans in, in western China. Presumably there's a prevailing wind, I hope, going down, going down in this direction. Uh, there's also objects that are formed from meteorites actually falling down through the, through the atmosphere. They're called oriented meteorites, and they likely are forming through ablation. They're probably spinning, kind of spinning objects that get stabilized and spinning in one direction as they, as they fall down. And then ablation from heating forms them into, which is close to erosion, forms them into this conical shape. And then uh, these are called hoodoos, and this is actually a uh, Maybe they're water form, perhaps they're, they're from uh, motion wind over them. But the re real reason why I have this picture in here is this from my grandfather's farm in northern Montana. They have a very, he had a very famous rock formation on it called the Jerusalem Rocks, and these are called hoodoos, and you find them in various places. So anytime we write an erosion paper, I'm trying to get the word hoodoos like, put, into the, put into the paper. So, so here's the experiment. So you just take a five centimeter piece of clay, like that, and we put it into our water tunnel. And so here I think the, the speed is, well, I had a speed here before, but it seems to have disappeared, is about a half a meter a second, something like that, which means the Reynolds number, oh, there it is, 60 centimeters per second. And so the Reynolds number is around 10 to the four. So this is a high Reynolds number flow. And so here is a case where you can really see, this is a, uh, time-lapse photograph where there are small particles that are seeded into the flow and so then in time-lapse you see they form little streak lines that you can actually measure the length of and then get velocities, back velocities out of them. And you can see that the velocity changes very rapidly from the sphere surface where the velocity has to be zero in the lab frame to something which is much larger and that means that you have a very sharp boundary layer in this region. And this boundary layer is departing from the body about right there, and you can see a little vortex right there, it's a recirculation zone vortex. And then you have a big wake behind it, which is an alternating time periodic wake, as you see with the von Karman type of structure. And so there's kind of a schematic of that. And this is what you get out of it after about an hour or so. You take this kind of spherical object and you turn it into this kind of semi-conical faceted shape. One of the most interesting things about it, well, first of all, it seems to have something this close to an angle, maybe 100 degrees, one might guess. And though it's kind of, though obviously it's rounded, it has this nice facet that seems associated with this recirculation zone, and it has an absolutely flat back end, which I find very weird. So, uh, Life did some other experiments to, to try to understand how, whether the erosion rate that we were observing could be related to, the we were thinking it was related to the shear rate. So I have a, a, a fluid, I have a boundary layer, and it's changing uh, from zero to uh, some, say, around 60 centimeters per second very rapidly. So I have a lot of shear in this region. And shear is something you could imagine is kind of exerting a, a force on the boundary. It might be tearing microscopic pieces of the boundary off. And in fact, you could actually watch little pieces, you can see little clouds of, of, of kind of clay particles coming off. You can actually see it by eye. And so what he discovered by some, some clever experiments, using, using flat sheets of clay instead of uh, things like this, was that the erosion rate seemed to be linearly related to the shear stress. So, then what can you do with that? And then we started doing some modeling, and it turned out it was a lot simpler to, to construct mathematical models if you were dealing with a two-dimensional flow rather than a three-dimensional flow. You have many more tools available to you. And so, but here's one of the things that, that, that uh, life uh, noticed. So here is the, for a cylinder now, that's put into the tunnel. This is showing the cross-section in time, color-coded in time, 
as it's shrinking down. And there it is, rescaled so that each of these cross sections has equal area. And so what you see is that this initially circular cross section is collapsing down onto a universal shape where you have this kind of blunt, or rather not quite so blunt, maybe quarterish type uh, front, a little faster the back and a flat back end. And so it's going into a self-similar shape. So, of course, that brings you back to these, these first pictures that I showed you of these Yadon features. They all seem to be the same. Perhaps there's some attracting you know, morphology for the, for the features that are being reflected in that kind of erosion. And we're certainly seeing something like that in this, in this type of experiment. You know, it, ter it turns out that there's been a fair amount of work that's been done on what's called geomorphology. So how landscapes form, the actions of rivers, and, and so forth. But there's almost, and those are very complicated theories, have lots of unfixed, stripped down, simple circumstances of simple geometric objects where you could actually do some real modeling and understand what was, what was going on. So it turns out that another thing that, and that really this came out of the modeling, which I'll, I'll discuss in just uh, briefly in just a second, is that usually you think of erosion as kind of a smoothing process of some sort. You think about pebbles that are rolling around on the stream of the bed, and they become nice and round and smooth. But that's the case where the erosion is taking place kind of isotropically. It's, it's, in a, it's, in a, it's in an environment which is kind of chipping away at it from all directions. And this is not that. This is the case where you're saying, I have a unidirectional flow, and I'm just laying it wear this thing away, and I see what happens. And so what we find, actually, is that you don't, you don't observe that it goes towards a smooth shape. You don't observe that it goes towards a shape which is, say, somehow reducing drag or something like that. There's no principle like that. The principle seems to be basically this. If I have an erosion rate that depends on the shear rate in a monotonic way, then if I have a little bump in the surface, it wants to wear that bump away more rapidly. So it brings the bump down. That's a smoothing process. If I have a divot, then it will wear around the divot more rapidly. And that's a smoothing project process. But what it's really saying is that you're getting surfaces where you have constant shear stress, so everything is wearing at the same rate is if there's a nail sticking up, the flow is going to bang it down. So uh, with Nick Moore, uh, one, of, one of our postdocs, uh, we cooked up, I think, a, a nice model for how this happens dynamically. And it, it uses this free stri streamline theory, again, in a, in a dynamical setting, and uses boundary layer theory uh, to calculate what is the shear stress that's being exerted by an outer flow that's associated with the wake. On the, on the front side where the boundary layer is attached, on the front side of, a, of an object. And from this, uh, we could actually, in simulation, get things that were very close to what's observed in the experiment. We saw the emergence of self-similarity from these simulations. We saw the emergence of uniform shear stress along the front side. And more than that, we had theoretical predictions that based on boundary layer scaling again, that said that the area should actually uh, disappear when you're in this self-similar regime. It should disappear like some t minus t starts at the four-thirds. So we'll go away with the four-thirds power. And actually, we also observe that in, in our simulation. So we seem to have, in this simple example, we seem to have a pretty good handle on, on pretty much everything that's going on. But there's lots of other interesting things to look at. You could say, well, what if I have a heterogeneous material? Hoodoos look like they're made of, of stone that has a variety of, of resistances to whatever the process is that's eroding them away. What if you have multiple objects so that they're interacting with each other hydrodynamically somehow? Perhaps it has to do with these Yadon structures. So there's lots of interesting things. How about problems like dissolution? So I have something that's dissolving rather than being worn away. And anyway, so it's, it's a nice set of things. Okay, so uh, what time does it? I have to, well, I forgot my cell phone. What's that? It's past five. Five past five. So like a half an hour is more or less. Okay. So uh, so this is a this is what I call a transition slide. So uh, I've been talking about all these very high Reynolds number flows, and you could treat them with uh, mathematical tools that come out of looking at special solutions to the Euler equations, either dynamically or or in their steady state forms. But I had said something about this guy. I just want to show you one thing that's kind of intermediate range before I start talking about very small objects. 
So the hydrogen atom is typically of many such very small objects. And so uh, I said a transition slide, and it's indeed, I, I just want to show this because it's a transition from low Reynolds number to high. So one, one aspect of high Reynolds number flow is that in the kinds of locomotion that you see at high Reynolds number, it typically involves, say, if you're talking about a, a, a fish that's using its pectoral fins to swim, or a goose flapping its wings, this kind of thing, is undergoing a, a kind of a, a stroke change that has time reversal symmetry. So kind of the first half of the period looks like the time reversal of the second half. You're kind of doing this, then you're doing that. And so it turns out that that type of way of getting, which to get around using that kind of stroke, actually you, you need to be shedding vortices, discrete vortices. And it turns out discrete vortices aren't really something you get to shed when you're a microorganism. That, that kind of behavior doesn't exist to you. And so, or it's not accessible to you. So, uh, to explore kind of the range where you're sitting between the low Reynolds number and the high Reynolds number world, uh, June and Steve cooked up the following cute experiment. I'll just show you uh, a, a simulation of it from, from work with this, of mine with this guy, Silas Solomon again. Uh, but where, where it really came from was from Steve going down to the Antarctic and uh, studying it. A, got an NSF to pay for this, which I think is great. Of course, we don't have an NSF right now. Maybe, maybe we do. But uh, it, it came from studying a small mollusk called Cleona antarctica. And the interesting thing about this mollusk is that when it's a juvenile, then here you can see it has a little set of wings. I think there it's about two centimeters long, something like that. But when it's smaller, the way it gets around is, it, it is using three ciliary bands around its waist. And it has little cilia doing a power and recovery stroke, like, like a paramecium, something like that. So it had this nice non-time reversible stroke. And that's typical of what you see at a low Reynolds number. And when it gets big enough, it unfurls a set of wings and it starts to fly around instead. So it's kind of a flyer, a bird doing the little thing uh, in a fluid. And so that motivated uh, us to look at what might be happening. At, and this happens for a Reynolds number around 20. That's when that happens. And so that motivated uh, us to come up, in June in particular, to come up with a simple experiment that might shed light on this. And the, the experiment is the following. You just take a big tank of water, and you take a uh, metal bar, a flat metal bar, and you mount it on a rod that's free to rotate, and you pump this metal bar up and down. Okay? So that's a nice, if it doesn't rotate, that's a nice time reversible stroke. If you pump it slowly enough, that means you're acting at low Reynolds number. And so if you kind of tap it a little bit, it doesn't start to move or anything like that. It just slows down and you just go up and down. And you, there it is moving up and down right there. But once you cross a critical frequency of flapping, which means your Reynolds number has gotten big enough, then it turns out it starts to process around in one direction or the other, but in only one direction. And it leaves behind it, and it does a flapping locomotion, much like that of a bird, and it leaves behind it a vertical pattern that's what's called reverse von Karman street, which is actually what you see with, with flying birds. And so just to, and it turns out that, that this emerges from a symmetry breaking instability. I just want to show you a movie about this. And this is from a simulation. So this is a little elliptic wing. You're moving it up and down. It's free to go left or right. And there's a little perturbation about size 10 to minus 2 in the initial velocity. And from that perturbation, it can access a symmetry breaking instability. And this guy will just start to coherently locomote, in this case, just to the left, leaving behind it this nice reverse von Karman street. So what this is showing you is that flapping locomotion arises right at the boundary between low Reynolds number and high Reynolds number. And this is very kind of a nice attracting locomotion strategy. So if you want to think fancifully for a second, you can imagine that you have a small organism, it's got some appendages that it uses to stir up the fluid around it and bring the fluid around. That's successful, so it gets bigger. And then at some point it gets big enough that those appendages actually let it fly. And then maybe something like that. Maybe that's another route to something like flapping flight, at least in, in the world. Okay. Now I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about a very different class of problems. And uh, so that's kind of my high Reynolds number uh, world, if you like, my set of favorite problems. 
but I've been working very intensely for, for about the past uh, 10 years or so uh, on problems that have to do with, with the interactions of, of particles at very small scales. And uh, this is really mo originally motivated by thinking about a set of experiments that had to do with the emergence of large-scale flow structures in bacterial suspensions. So you have many bacteria that are in, in fluid, they're swimming around, they interact with each other hydrodynamically, and it turns out that <coughs> that can lead to uh, kind of large-scale chaotic dynamics that has uh, much longer time scales and length scales than, than are associated with single bacteria. So, uh, and that led to other work thinking about what are called active fluids or active fluid systems uh, in general, which are which is really kind of as a class of problems is what I would call an extreme version of fluid body interactions at a very small scale. And uh, it also reminds me, Feynman has this. Uh, famous lecture or uh, lecture and paper called There's Lots of Room at the Bottom, where, where Feynman was, was uh, postulating there were lots of interesting things that one could look at when you're really looking at the very small scale rather than the very large scale. And for example, he, he had a nice uh, little statement about one of these days maybe we'll just swallow the doctor, you know, and, and uh, some little object will swim around and repair your ills. Oh, it's very prescient. Okay. So uh, this general area is called active matter. It's, because it's a very burgeoning field. And it, it has to do with systems where I have objects that are interacting with each other. Say it might be hydrodynamically or a combination of hydrodynamics and other types of interactions. And uh, I have many of them. And it turns out they have some sort of immersion behavior that comes out of, out of that interaction. So a bacterial suspension is one such example. Uh, perhaps the mitotic spindles and other examples of some sort. Mitotic spindles, for example, uh, can form spontaneously out of, out of egg extract. If you put a little piece of DNA in there, you'll, you'll get things that look like mitotic spindles just form perfectly well. Uh, I'll also talk about a, a problem that has to do with, a, with an active, so what's an active fluid? An active fluid is where the objects in the fluid are turning one source of energy into, say, a chemical, might be from ATP or something like that, into some sort of displacement or change in shape or change in position. So they're kind of complex fluids that where the kind of microstructure in the fluid is uh, able to exert stresses that aren't resulting from external forces or from thermodynamic forces. It's just resulting from some consumption of another energy source and, and causing it to exert a so-called active stress on the system. So the it's kind of a preamble to that because the first example I'll talk about are, are, are things motivated by bacterial suspensions. I just want to say a, a little bit about what the facts of life are when you're at very small scales. So now I'm talking about Reynolds numbers at 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 4, this kind of thing. And so uh, this fellow uh, Purcell uh, elucidated, I think, what was already kind of a, a known fact, but uh, gave it a name. It's called the scallop theorem. And it really encapsulates the difference between how something gets itself around or displaces itself at low Reynolds number rather than at, at not low Reynolds number. And so one thing that you see in uh, low Reynolds number locomotion is that there are no time reversal symmetric shape changes. And that's because, as Purcell elucidated, if I have a time reversible shape change, it may move me in the first half of the stroke, but on the second half it just puts me back where I was. And that's because you, you lack this extra time scale that's associated with inertia when you're at a higher Reynolds number flow. And, and what's left in the flow equations is just a boundary value problem. And you're just doing kind of reversible things on the boundary and you just come back to where you were. And so when you're looking at spermatozoa, they are propagating uh, uh, shape change waves through their tail. Pymetomonas does, an, an algae does, uses two flagella to do a power and recovery stroke. Paramecia do the same, though they're covered with them, or something like C. elegans. And certainly bacteria, they have a helical flagellum that they're turning and so kind of screwing fluid past them. So they're creating a, a wave of, of fluid being pushed back. And so as far as modeling these kinds of things, uh, we're pretty good at modeling with, with some detail, uh, single or a few of these objects interacting with the fluid. And so uh, here are some uh, number of kind of modeling studies that I referred to here. 
uh, looking at synthetic you know, virtual swimmers that are uh, magnetically driven and, and have kind of optimized uh, shapes for propulsion. And this comes from some work I did with a couple of postdocs uh, a couple of years ago, where uh, we were trying to understand whether we could take uh, simple uh, synthetic swimmers, that, I guess that's about a micron long, and driven by rotating magnetic fields, so they kind of screw themselves to the fluid, whether we could optimize the shape so that we would improve their transport performance. <clears throat> and we did the same kinds of things with, with another type of swimmer uh, up here, due to, due to Zhang, which kind of grew through a delamination process, which was very interesting. But, or uh, there's very nice work in looking at the detailed interactions of a, of a bunch of model bacteria uh, based on a method called the regularized Stokeslip method due to Ricardo Cortez. But it turns out that a lot of the really interesting problems, at least to me, are when you don't just have one or a few of these objects, but you have tens of thousands of them, or maybe hundreds of thousands of them. And so this is a, uh, a movie of a bacterial suspension. It's actually near the meniscus of a drop. And what you're seeing are tens of thousands of bacteria subtilis. They are swimming around, probably around 10 microns per second, something like this. They're about five microns in length. But what they're doing through their interactions, which seem to be mediated by the fluid, is to create much larger scale flow structures, which actually you see in this, this kind of velocity image that was extracted from the data, where you have very time dependent behaviors. You have vortices, you have jets, and the sizes of the jets are about an order of magnitude, in this case, greater than that of any of the single swimmer speeds. The sizes of the objects are about an order of magnitude bigger. So somehow the fluid is allowing all these swimmers to kind of collectively create a macroscopic complex flow. So that's the kind of problem I'm really more interested in understanding. And so this has become kind of a canonical example of what's called active matter in this case. So you're getting the emergence in this, in, in this case, a rather simple medium, just a simple Newtonian fluid the emergence of much larger uh, timescale structures that have kind of care, coherent structures floating around it. And so uh, this is a simulation uh, that I, I did with a, a very talented postdoc uh, a few years ago named David Santian. Actually, this just came out last year, I think, uh, showing a 3D simulation of 10,000 motile rods. And so when you want to do 10,000, you don't do detailed uh, reconstructions of bacteria. Instead, what you do is you just say, oh, here's my swimmer. It's a rod-like thing. And all I do to make it swim is I say it has a, a propulsive stress on, on one half of its body and a no-slip condition on the other. And that propulsive stress, which is given as a boundary condition, pushes the rod around. If it were left to itself, it would just swim you know, just in a straight line. But when you put 10,000 of them together, See if I can get this guy to go again. <laughs> then it turns out that they couple hydrodynamically, and you see the emergence of flow structures, which are at least qualitatively, uh, when you analyze everything, very similar to what you find in, in the bacterial suspensions. You can see there's now a lot of local ordering. We start off with an isotropic kind of arranged system that had no order. And you can see there's lots of local order. Things tend to be aligned. You can see kind of blank regions where which are speaking to kind of having clarification of, of the swimmers in certain regions. We see some of these called large number fluctuations coming out of this. So uh, it's a very, very different kind of problem to look at. And so the kind of model that we had, as I said, this very simple model is really elucidated by this slide. So here's our model for a, for a bacterium. Okay? So in our hands, a bacterium is just a straight rod. And it has, a, it has a propulsive stress, it's pushing fluid back here, it's moving upward, and so it's dragging fluid here, and it creates kind of an extensile flow along the rod as a consequence. On the other hand, here's our rod-like primidomonas, something that's pulled from the front. So if it's pulled from the front, the propulsive stress is switched sides, switch ends, so it's pulling fluid back here. And it's dragging the payload up so it has fluid stuck there. So it creates, even though it's going in the same direction, it creates a local flow, compressive flow, that's moving out along the way. So it's a different sign. And so what you can see from this already is that you might expect that swimmers that look like this, that have a local flow field that look like this, when they're put together, are going to interact with each other very differently than swimmers that look like this. These 
if they're aligned, you can see these local flows are going to cause them to misalign. Well, on the other hand, if I have this kind of sucking in a fluid along the waist here, if I have another rod here that's the same, they will tend to align with each other. And I think that basic effect is what underlies seeing that you get this kind of local alignment and also this these kind of local packs swimming around in the simulations. And so just to show you how profound this difference is, I'm going to show you two simulations, one of pushers and one of pullers. And the only difference, they have the same number, the only difference is their propulsion mechanism. And what I'm going to let them do is I'm going to let them mix colored pieces of fluid, and you can just see the difference between them. If I can get my mouse to come back. So in both cases, I have 10,000 swimmers in 3D. On the left are the pushers. And you can see that pushers create large-scale flow structures. And because they create large-scale flow structures, you mix the fluid globally and rapidly. So you have a lot of kind of stretching and folding of fluid elements. On the other hand, because of this kind of decorrelation mechanism that has to do with interacting pullers, these guys are always kind of decorrelated from each other. So this looks more like some sort of molecular diffusion. And all that's going on is I just have kind of independent swimmers. They do interact, but in kind of a destructive rather than a constructive way. These swimmers, instead, just drag bits of fluid with them, and they're not creating a large-scale flow that creates large masses of fluid being dragged with them. So it mixes on a much slower time scale. So we, we learned a lot from these kinds of things. Uh, we learned about the existence and nature of large-scale flow instabilities. We derived kind of a dilute suspension theory, kind of a continuing theory for, for these kinds of active suspensions. And they taught us all about flow instabilities. Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, the effect of the propulsion mechanism and body shape, they have what's called very, they have very bizarre what's called rheology. You can have things like negative suspension viscosities, all, all sorts of weird things that go on. And the kinds of things that, we're, that not just me, but many other people are, are trying to understand now are what are the relative importance of things like hydrodynamic interactions versus steric interactions. So it's a steric interaction, so it's two things running into each other, right? They can't pass through each other. So that's important at large, large concentrations. The effects of confinement. Lots of these types of flows experimentally take place in, in microfluidic geometries. Or in nature, they, you, you may, you're obviously confined to the in some fashion. Uh, can you extract useful work from these types of systems? There was a very beautiful experiment where uh, Igor Aronson's group at Lauren Livermore took a little micro gear, it's something shaped like a gear, that had kind of a ratchet tooth on the outside, and they just put it into a bacterial suspension, and it just started to spin in one direction from its interaction. I and mean, that's not something you can get from a, a system of thermodynamic equilibrium. And so this thing just started to spin in, in one direction. So you can extract work. You can, you, we have models where you, where you take a continuum version of this, and you put it into a channel. And once the channel is kind of big enough, these Particles interact with each other in such a way as spontaneously forms a pump. So, they, so they're very, very interesting systems to look at. So they, there's there are problems where they're kind of internally forced. They're not referring, they're not responding to exterior, the exterior world. They're constantly forcing the, the, the medium in which they sit and interacting with each other through that. Okay, so we're probably on time now. Ten minutes. Perfect. Okay. So there's another, there's another very, not actually in some ways, not so different class of problems, it turns out, from the, from the aspect of modeling. But uh, there's, there's a, another set of uh, systems that are very interesting to look at, which have to do with, with subcellular structures that are uh, studied very equivalent, uh, that are being driven and coupled together by kind of active crosslinks made, made of motor proteins. And so here, here is uh, uh, two examples. And, and one I'll talk about here in just a second. In, in this, what this is showing is uh, the process is called pronuclear migration. And so uh, this is in a single cell C elements embryo, which has been fertilized by the male, and the male pronucleus is there on the right. And what's happened is that uh, there is something that's, so what you're seeing is GFP labeled tubulin, and you can see this kind of star-like, two star-like structures uh, that are sitting on either side of the pronucleus. And those are called centrosomes. And what they are are just 
star-like concentrations of microtubules that are radiating, radiating out into the surrounding cytoplasm. And the uh, female uh, gets moved by presumably motions actually along the periphery initially, but it kind of gets coupled up with, with, with the male half, say right there. And then this little object here is moved into the center of the cell and then it rotates so that the centrosomes are lined up at the long axis of the cell. And then at that point, the nuclear membrane dissolves, the so-called mitotic spindle forms, you end up having chromosomal segregation, and then there's cell division, these kinds of things. So I'm going to talk about modeling at that. That seems like a nice way to, to start into looking at another problem that really has to do with the mitotic spindle, which is this kind of very interesting object that, that forms prior to chromosomal segregation and is involved in kind of tearing apart the chromosomes and pulling them into the two new halves of the cell. And uh, from these types of ingredients, which are motor proteins and microtubules and these kinds of things, there's been some very interesting recent work uh, done in trying to create synthetic analogs of these types of systems and study them instead in the test tube instead of in cells, where you can very more precisely control levels of things like ATP or, or the types of motor proteins that you have and what's the length distribution of the microtubules and so forth. So you can look at these kinds of, of systems in a much more controlled setting and, and it's kind of there I think that mathematicians and modelers can get their hands on, on constructing models and compare them with experiment and they kind of take those further to looking at, at more complicated objects. And so what this is is what's called uh, empty pneumatic turbulence. It's these types of objects, MTs connected by motor proteins, but bound onto a surface between oil and water. And there's kinesin clusters or motor protein clusters that are coupling uh, pairs of, of microtubules and causing them to slide relative to each other. And that behavior creates large-scale dynamics and creates what's called an active pneumatic state on, on the surface. Okay, but let me talk uh, very briefly about, about some about this problem. So there is pronuclear migration again in this nice movie. There the mitotic spindle has formed. Chromosomes have been segregated. Two halves formed and so on. And there's that uh, same GFP label plot or uh, image I showed you before. And I, I should say that, that this work I, I did a few years ago with uh, a developmental biology group uh, at NYU under Fabio Piano uh, with a postdoc of mine to Martian at uh, UC Davis. And so we decided we were going to, what we wanted to do was to understand how this type of, of centration and rotation to proper position might happen within a very kind of stripped down, almost mechanical model. Could we explain some of the observations using kind of simple fluid structure interaction rules with something that's exerting forces on these microtubules? Because the one thing that you observe in these movies is that fluid elements or, or, or cytoplasmic elements are flowing along those microtubules towards the centrosomes. So it seems that there's something active that's sitting and, and pulling objects along those microtubules. And could they be involved in this kind of this whole process? So motivated by some very nice uh, uh, simple modeling work done by a Japanese group, we cooked up the following model and, and made it, uh, if you like, more realistic. But really just following on, on their work. 